Hey, this is Dr. A. So we're going to go over pregnancy growth and genetics in this lesson. So uh, development, which includes the increase in size, which is growth, is the continuous process by which an in in individual changes from one life phase to another. So that's development. So you go from birth all the way to death in development, but we're going to look mostly at prenatal development and then just a little bit at aging and stuff like that. And so development, yes, it's growing, but it's also maturing and et cetera. The life phases uh, are the prenatal and postnatal phases. So the prenatal phase or period begins at fertilization and ends at birth. And the postnatal period begins at birth and ends at death. And then we're going to divide up the postnatal period and other um, periods too. You'll see you with um, when we get to aging and stuff. The union of a secondary oocyte and a sperm cell is called fertilization or conception. And it results in a new cell called a zygote. And it usually takes place in the uterine tube, especially in the upper third of the uterine tube. So here's a cool little picture of fertilization, like all the little sperm cells, they're trying to get into the egg. So the sperm cells have to reach the upper one third of the uterine tubes or fallopian tubes for fertilization to occur. Under the influence of estrogen during that first half of the menstrual cycle, the uterine secretions are thin, which allows the sperm cells to be able to swim easily toward their destination. So, um, yeah, estrogen at the beginning gets everything ready for the egg to be released, and then the egg is released and favors the sperm getting up there. The prostaglandins in semen um, will stimulate the sperm flagella for swimming and will cause muscular contractions of the uterus, the uterine tubes, and will aid in sperm movement. So um, that is, you know, during intercourse, of course, and uh, the point of, of that with the orgasm and the contractions is to get the sperm all the way up, up that uterus and all the way up the fallopian tubes. So with the aid of these acrosomal enzymes, which we talked about in the male reproductive uh, system, the sperm cells can erode away the corona radiata that's around that secondary oocyte in the zona pellucida. And um, the head of one and only one sperm cell can penetrate the egg cell membrane. Once one of these little guys makes it in, basically the egg locks down everything else. Um, there are some chemical changes that happen in the membrane and it prevents the entry of any additional sperm cells so we don't have any kind of confusion of whose genetic material gets in it's the first one that gets in that gets to contribute the sperm cell then nucleus will start s swelling and became and become the male pronucleus and then the secondary oocyte will complete meiosis as um if you've seen in the graph in the reproductive system for the female has to finish the meiosis so that it has 23 haploid uh, chromosomes and that the once it completes that that nucleus will become the female pronucleus and then both male and female pronucleus fuse together in complete fertilization and you have a diploid zygote meaning a cell that has 46 chromosomes but you have the, your two arms of chromosome one your two arms of chromosome two etc etc so one from my mom one from dad every time Okay, so a diploid zygote would have how many chromosomes? And total, not pairs, total. Okay, so again, here's a little representation of the secondary oocyte here completing meio meiosis, and the sperm, the one sperm cell got in, and it's going to get to contribute uh, its genetic material, and everything else is going to get locked out. Okay, so this is a video call from uh, conception to birth, and I'm not going to play it here, but I have it linked for you below, and you should really watch it. It's beautiful. Uh, so let's talk about pregnancy. So pregnancy is a presence of a developing offspring in the uterus. It lasts about 38 weeks, and it is divided into a trimester of about three months. Now, um, if you're wondering about how to calculate your due date and stuff, they usually do it from the first day of your last period, which then to which they will add... Uh, 40 weeks, 40, it's not that you're pregnant 40 weeks, you're really only pregnant 38, but uh, that's how to calculate because you have the first day of your last period, and then on day 14 you would have ovulation, so that would be around the time you would have gotten pregnant, so that's 14 days, so two weeks from 
first day of your last period. Um, the cells uh, will undergo a period of, of mitosis. So mitosis is division and identical copying of the chromosomes and stuff. And um, this period of mitosis is called cleavage. The cells divide, but they become smaller and smaller and smaller, meaning the zygote has a set size, and it doesn't, that size doesn't change, but every time it divides, the, the cells that make it up become smaller and smaller. Um, that dividing solid mass of cell is called a morula, and that's for the Latin word for blackberry. It moves down a uterine tube to the uterus, and it takes about, starts, well, the whole journey takes seven days, but that more life phase takes about three days. Then it starts hollowing out, and it forms a blastocyst, and that's the blastocyst is what will implant into the endometrium of the uterus by the end of that first week. So it takes, um, so the, egg, the, the sperm swim all the way up, and they get to the, to the egg, they fertilize the egg, and then it takes a week of it dividing and tumbling down before it can actually implant. Um, up to this point, all the cells in that blastocyst and stuff are all pluripotent stem cells, meaning there are stem cells that could become anything in the body. There's not been any kind of differentiation yet, okay? We're at the beginning. Everything is just stem cells right now. So here's a representation. So again, you have uh, fertilization going on here. You have your zygote, and then you have your divisions. So you can see that the, the size stays the same of this, the, the organism, if you will, itself, the zygote itself, but the, the cells that make it up become smaller and smaller and smaller. And by day six or seven, you have this blastocyst that can implant. So fertilization, a week, and then you get implantation. Okay, so um, certain cells of that blastocyst will organize into the inner cell mass that will give rise to the embryo, be becoming eventually the baby, and uh, that will make it the beginning of the embryonic stage at that point in time. The other cells of the blastocyst will become the placenta, uh, and they're the ones that are going to implant in there here, and those will also secrete hormones to maintain the pregnancy. And the placenta, of course, also is going to secrete hormones. Um, the offspring is called an embryo at this point in time, um, and that is during the first eight weeks of development, and then it's a fetus until the end of development. So it's an embryo basically from the time it implants on you know, the end of week one and beginning of week two all the way till the end of week eight. So let's talk a little bit about hormonal changes during pregnancy. So the outer layer of cells, the trophoblast of that blastocyst, um, will start secreting the hormone human chorionic, uh, chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. That is the pregnancy hormone. The HCG's, HCG's job is to signal the corpus luteum to keep making progesterone. And so uh, as long as the corpus luteum is getting the signal, it'll make progesterone. The progesterone maintains the uterine lining, and um, that maintains the pregnancy because you need that uterine, uterine lining to be, for the baby to stay implanted. If, you can't, if you're not making, if that corpus luteum does not make enough progesterone, then you could have an early miscarriage because that lining is going to be shed because it's not being maintained because you don't have enough progesterone. And so sometimes in some of the fertility treatments, uh, women will be given progesterone to uh, maintain that early pregnancy to maintain uh, those levels up. So the levels of HCG will remain high until the placenta can produce enough hormones on its own to maintain the pregnancy. So uh, basically it's going to be high during the first trimester, and during that first trimester the ovaries are going to be producing those, the majority of those hormones. Um, the hormone HCG is the basis of pregnancy test, and it starts being released once you have, you know, the blastocyst that's implanted. So, um, and it will be detectable quite quickly once you have implantation, but the thing is you have to think about from the time you, there has been sex and fertilization happen, it's a week before for it to travel down and implant, right? So um, it's usually pointless to do a pregnancy test, for example, the day, the morning after, if you will, or the day after, thinking, um, you know, maybe it'll detect it. You need to, to wait at least a week or two before it will really properly detect if there's a pregnancy. That usually is by that time you've missed your period. So the placenta will also secrete placental lactogens uh, for breast development and along with placental estrogens and placental progesterone and relaxin. So again, um, the lactogen will 
you know, lacto for milk will allow the milk to start getting, the, the whole idea of milk production starting. And again, estrogens and progesterone will maintain the pregnancy, maintain the uterine lining and all of that. And then relaxin is a hormone that will allow the um, kind of some of the muscles and ligaments and tendons and all that to relax and start accommodating the, sun, the growing baby in the womb. Uh, there, um, some uh, other hormonal changes will be uh, an increase in aldosterone. So if you want to go back to the renal chapter on aldosterone, it promotes fluid retention by uh, reclaiming sodium and dumping potassium. All right, and so that means you're going to retain fluid. You're going to have more fluid loads um, just because you need more um, volume and more fluid for the baby too. And then also parathyroid hormone to make sure that you have a high calcium level in the blood because you're building a baby. The baby needs calcium. Its bones might need calcium and all of that. Okay, so again, it's a little cr critical um, application here. If you had sex and you were ovulating at that time and you think you might be pregnant, how soon can you run a pregnancy test and get a result to confirm that you are pregnant? Uh, and so select an answer for that. Okay, so this graph shows, um, you can see, so the HCG level is going to be going really, really high, and then first trimester, and then it'll kind of drop off and level off at month four, and then just kind of be steady, and because it's stimulating um, the corpus luteum to produce these estrogen and progesterone, but you can see these are going up, and then the placenta is going to take over, and it's going to keep them going. So um, these maintain the pregnancy, and one of the th signals that um, will trigger labor is if these guys, estrogen progesterone starts to drop off. So estrogen will be at the highest of a few weeks, like two to three weeks before delivery, and again, progesterone, uh, its job is to block uh, contractions and stuff like that, but as soon as these guys start dropping, you're going to have all the kind of pre-labor stuff uh, kicking in too. So your body preparing for labor. Um, Another little practical application. Uh, consider a chart that was up. Can you venture a guess of which hormone is probably causing morning sickness? Uh, which morning sickness usually goes away at about four months? So when we looked at that graph, which one do you think might be responsible? Okay, so uh, let's talk about the embryonic stage. So the embryonic stage lasts from the second to the eighth week of development, and um, during which the placenta will develop, and then all the main internal organs and major external features will appear. So literally in like eight weeks, you have almost like a fully formed baby. It just has to refine, but like everything is there. The heart's there, the brain's there, you know, it has the shape of a baby and all of that. So as the embryo implants, the trophoblast will develop an inner layer called a chorion, and they will send out little extensions into the endometrium of the mom, and that will develop into the chorionic villi. And then the chorionic villi develop, and they are going to be in spaces called lacunae is going to form around the villi, and they fill with maternal blood. And so this is the beginning of the placenta and the site of exchange of blood between mom and baby. And it's not really exchange of blood, it's exchange of nutrients across the, the, the capillaries, but it's where the, there's that connection there between the two. Um, so this process here... So, I'm sorry, the embryonic blood vessels will extend through the connecting stalk and develop it, ca capillaries in this chorionic villi, and that basically is the beginning of the formation of the placenta. And the role of the placenta is gas exchange and delivery of nutrients, um, and then removal of waste and stuff. The placental membrane is composed of the epithelium of the chorionic villus and the endothelium of the capillary inside the villus. So, um, it's, it's an interface mom and baby, basically, across capillaries. And so if you see them here, the little tree-like extensions here are the chorionic villi that are from the baby, that are connected to the baby. And this pool here of purple is representing pools of maternal blood there in the endometrium that is bringing all that rich, um, oxygen-rich, nutrient-rich blood to the baby and then it's just crossing over. And so you can see here again the pool, but it's there's a little space there, right? There's a little bit of space, and so it has to cross that space to get into the baby's capillaries to get into that circulation. 
Okay, so during the second week, um, another membrane called the amnion is developing around the embryo, and that will become the amniotic sac. Um, inside a chorion, and um, it will hold in cush cushion the cushioning amniotic fluid. During the second week, the embryo is now called a gastrula, and its inner cell mass will transform into um, the embryonic disc, and you're going to see germ layers. There are layers that form with it that will become the beginning of all organ systems. So those are the primary germ layers. There are three. We have ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. So the ectoderm will give rise to the nervous system, portions of your special sensory organs, so that would be eyes, nose, ears, etc. The epidermis, so that's your skin, and all the epidermal derivatives, hair, nail, etc. And the linings of the mouth and the anal canal. Then the mesodermal cells will make all the muscles, bones, bone marrow, blood, blood and lymphatic vessels, internal reproductive organs, kidneys, connective tissue, and the epithelial lining of the body cavities. And then your endoderm, uh, endodermal cells will produce epithelial linings of the uh, digestive tract, respiratory tract, urinary bladder, and urethra, all the places where mucus lives, basically. Um, there, the two membranes form in association with the embryo, so we have the yolk sac and the allantois. So the yolk sac is formed during the second week, and it's the first site of blood cell formation and primary circulation. So it's the beginning of, yeah, production of red cells and the immune system and all of that. The allantois forms during the third week and joins the connecting stalk of the embryo, and it forms blood cells also, and it gives rise to the umbilical arteries and veins. This site of production of blood cells won't stay. I mean, this, this is the, the beginning of it, but then it's going to move to the bone marrow once the bone marrow is formed. By the fourth week, the heart is beating, which is really cool, and the head and jaws appear and the little limb buds form. So if you think about it in the sequence of things, like by the fourth week, a woman might now just be realizing that she's actually pregnant, right? An umbilical cord, uh, cord contains two umbilical arteries and one vein, and they form the connecting stalk in allantois. Um, during the fifth through the seventh week, the head will grow rapidly, and the face will develop all its little features, the limbs will elongate, and the fingers and little toes form. Okay, so by the beginning of the eighth week, the embryo is 30 millimeters in length, so that's a little over an inch, right? It's way less than five grams, which is not much at all, and it looks human, and it has all the essential body systems that have all formed. So this is from the beginning of the embryonic stage to the end of the embryonic stage. This is what it looks like by that eighth week at the end of the embryonic stage. So the embryonic stage concludes at the end of the eighth week, and this period is really susceptible to what we call teratogens, and they can cause congenital malformations. So teratogens are are um, chemicals and things that can cause uh, these malformations um, a problem in the formation of the baby. So they can be things like drugs, um, but they can also be things like uh, different infections and stuff like that. Alcohol is another teratogen. Um, there's a lot of, um, of the mood medications, bipolar medications and all that, and it can be teratogens too, and it can cause problems with the development of the baby. So if you will look one up and throw one in there, an example of a teratogen. Um, so now let's talk about the fetal stage. The fetal stage begins at the end of that eighth week of development and lasts until birth. During this period, baby grows rapidly and the body proportions change considerably. So the little arms and legs are going to get longer. They get, they'll, they'll get to looking more and more like a, a baby that you would expect to look like. The existing structures grow and mature and only a few new parts appear. So everything was formed during the embryonic stage. The body enlarges, the limbs grow to the relative size that will maintain throughout development, and the, bo the bones ossify. So when the bones are initially formed, in, a lot of them are formed out of um, cartilage, and then that has to be slowly replaced by bone, and so this whole process is going on right now. Uh, by the end of the 12th week, the um, external reproductive organs are distinguishable as male and female, and that's when you can generally get a gender scan. 
So this would be end of embryonic stage, so around week eight, and this is uh, well, around week 12, give you kind of an idea. And this is just, uh, just not to freak you out, this is actually a representation uh, in like silica or silicone or something like that to, to what a um, you know, 12-week baby looks like. Okay, during the fifth month, the mother can feel the fetus move, fine hair appears, and dead epithelial cells and sebum cover the skin. So they have this covering, which is very helpful for them, uh, on them, and they're usually, we wash it off when they're born. Um, during the sixth month, the fetus gains weight, eyebrows and eyelids form, and the skin is wrinkled, translucent, and reddish. During the seventh month, though, subcutaneous fat is being deposited, eyelids open, you can look around and stuff, and in the final trimester, brain cells will form rapidly, and organs grow and mature <clears throat> as the fetus greatly increases in size. So that final trimester is when that baby is really putting on some weight and really growing. But the brain is developing, so it's another, it's just all of this, their um, development is critical in, in different stages for different reasons, but this development of the brain is uh, important. So this is a sonogram of a five-month-old fetus. There's some actually even better ones out there now. And so um, as it gets time for, for birth and near birth, the head should be down and butt up, and you can see the placenta here. Now, sometimes there can be complications with delivery. So if the placenta is over the opening of the cervix, that's called placental previa, and that could be deadly to both mom and baby. It usually requires a C-section. If the placenta tears away from the uh, uterus, then you can have bleeding, and that's called placental abruption. That can also be dangerous uh, and um, threatening to mom and baby. And of course, you do want head down, so if it, the baby presents butt first or feet first, you can have problems there too. So um, let's talk a little bit about fetal blood and fetal blood circulation. Um, so the substances will diffuse through the placental membrane, and uh, the umbilical vessels will carry them to and from the fetus. So we get that idea of the placenta being, you know, the source of nutrient and oxygen, and it brings it to the fetus. But there is some stuff here that's really interesting. So, um, first of all, fetal blood has a greater oxygen carrying capacity than maternal blood because they're both, if you think about it, bo both blood cells are across this barrier and you have to basic, basically talk the maternal cell into giving up the oxygen to the, the baby cell. And so the, the baby cell, the fetal cell, has to really like uh, want to hold on to it and, and carry a lot. Okay, and so that's the great oxygen carrying capacity. It's because, and it's because it doesn't have direct interface with the air where it can't pull. It doesn't have air in its lungs. And so the, 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 the oxygen that it's getting is via the blood circulation of the mom. Okay, so let's think about this. So register this. The baby does not have oxygen in its lungs. What does the baby have in its lungs? Fluid, okay? So every bit of oxygen it gets, it comes from the uh, placenta. So the um, umbilical vein has blood rich in oxygen. So here it is, or in, in your mind it's probably going to be backwards because it's a vein and it's rich in oxygen, okay? So it enters the body and travels to the liver and half of the blood will go into the liver and the other by will bypass it through this thing called the ductus venosus, which is only present in the babies and in the, in the uh, fetus. And uh, it basically joins this oxygenated blood with the deoxygenated blood of the vena cava. So we mixed it, it mixes the two. Then the blood's gonna you know, follow the vena cava to the right side of the heart. And then there is a foramen, foramen ovale. So it's oval opening, round opening between the, the two atria, right and left atria. And what happens is um, as blood is entering into the right side of the heart, um, instead of being really pumped to the lungs, because there's nothing going on in the lungs, it's going to bypass that, most of it is anyway, and it's going to go from right atria to left atria to be pumped to the rest of the body. Okay, so it, it, there's this kind of lung bypass, but some of it's going to go into the ventricle, the, the right ventricle, and some of it is going to be pumped to the lungs. So. Um, there is a second lung bypass, because again, there's nothing going on in the lungs at all, other than just it's, they're being developed. And the second one is the ductus arteriosus, and it connects the, the pulmonary trunk to the aortic arch. 
And so that blood that's being pumped through the pulmonary trunk on its way to the lungs actually can go ahead and just jump over and get into the aorta. And then there are also umbilical arteries, of course, um, that will carry blood from the iliac veins, um, I'm sorry, the iliac arteries to the placenta, where it can bring all the waste and then pick up nutrients and oxygen. So the arteries have the low oxygen weight full of waste blood, but the vein, the umbilical vein, has the nutrient rich and um, oxygenated blood. So it's backwards. So here again, there are illustrated. And so again, the umbilical vein have the are in, in um, red because they have the oxygenated blood and the arteries are in uh, blue. And you can see here it's in red. It's you know bringing oxygenated and nutrient rich and it goes to the liver, which makes sense because the liver processes nutrients and stuff like that. But then it bypasses here with that ductal spinosis and it mixes with unoxygenated blood. So they've represented this with purple because we have oxygenated and unoxygenated that mix. And then get to the heart, you have the foramen ovale that connects right and left atria here. But then if it does pump and goes uh, through this pulmonary arch, there um, is, I have it here, uh, it's a connection right there and it's called the uh, ductus arteriosus and it connects the pulmonary arch to the aortic arch. Um, Anyway, and so um, all of these adaptations allow the baby to get uh, the nutrients and oxygen that it needs while it's in the womb. So uh, list the substance that can cross the placenta. You can put something good, something bad. There's a lot of things that can cross the placenta and get into the baby's bloodstream. Okay, so let's talk about the birth process. Pregnancy will continue for 38 weeks and will terminate in the birth process. So as the placenta ages, you have they is producing less progesterone, which normally the progesterone inhibits uterine contractions. So then we start having some Braxton and Hicks contractions and some stuff. And so the cervix, um, with those contractions, the cervix will start thinning and opening. And, and it doesn't mean that we have labor going on yet. It's just it's kind of preparing to it. So a lot of times in a few weeks, you know, a couple weeks, uh, two, three weeks before delivery, um, the cervix could be slightly open and slightly thin already. Um, the decrease in progesterone concentration will stimulate the synthesis of different prostaglandins, which are thought to initiate labor. And then stretching the uterine tissues will stimulate the release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary and then that stimulates uterine contraction and then the fetal head will stretch the cervix and then you have this positive feedback mechanism that will result in stronger and stronger uterine contractions and a greater release of oxytocin which stimulates uterine contractions and it just keeps going so remember a positive feedback mechanism is like opening a faucet it's a, a thing that like feeds on itself like a almost like a domino effect and just keeps going and comes. So it's basically oxytocin causes stretching, stretching causes oxytocin, which causes stretching, which causes oxytocin and then et cetera, et cetera. It keeps going in contractions and well, stretching and contractions and then oxytocin, stretching and contractions and oxytocin and you, it keeps going until the baby has been delivered. So uh, that positive feedback cycle will cause abdominal muscles to contract with a greater force and the fetus will be forced through the birth canal to the outside. Following birth, the placenta is also expelled or delivered, if you will, too, by the continued uterine contraction. So it doesn't stop after the birth, it doesn't stop till the placenta is out. So here's the process here. So usually the amniotic sac, so we have first the cervix is opening, thinning, all of that. The amniotic sac will rupture. You'll, the water of the amniotic fluid will flow out. And then you'll have contractions, contractions. This could last hours and hours and hours, this whole process contractions. The cervix will open up more and more and more and more and more until it's dilated fully, 10 centimeters and stuff. And then uh, it will be, you know, you push and um, the, the muscles will help push the baby out. And then the uh, placenta here has to be um, delivered. So um, earlier when I talked about the position of the baby and all that, I mentioned several different birth complications. So go ahead and list a birth complication that can happen. There are more than what I talked about. Um, so just put one there so that you're aware that there are definitely things that can go wrong with birthing. Okay, and um, so let's talk a little bit about milk production and milk secretion. 
So the placental estrogens and progesterone and placental lactogen have all stimulated the uh, development of the mammary glands during the whole pregnancy process. And following childbirth, the action of prolactin is no longer inhibited by the, all these placental hormones because the placenta get delivered. Placenta is not there anymore, right? And so now the mammary glands can uh, are stimulated to produce large quantities of milk. The milk does not uh, readily flow into the ductile system, so it doesn't just push, rush out, right? But it has to be triggered uh, to, to let down is what is called by a reflex that involves the infant suckling at the breast. So the fact that the infant is hungry and latches on and starts suckling, that's what allows the milk to flow down into the breast and uh, the baby to get the milk. Um, that also triggers a release of oxytocin, the same hormone that initiated labor from the posterior pituitary. Oxytocin, so oxytocin does labor, it does bonding. And so it's also the orgasm hormone, so it bonds you with your mate, but it bonds you with your child. And also, um, kind of tied to labor, as it does contractions, it will actually gently contract your uterus and uh, get it to come back down to normal size after delivering a baby and stuff. Um, human milk is the best possible food for human babies. Um, the first milk or colostrum is watery, it's rich in protein, uh, and no, rich in protein than normal milk. Uh, it also contains antibodies from, from the mother's immune system, and that's breast milk just has antibodies from the mom's immune system, so it's protective to the baby. All right, so uh, following birth, a mother and newborn will experience different physiological and structural changes. So um, the neonatal period will begin abruptly at birth and last for four weeks. So he's a neonate the first month, baby is. Um, that first breath has to be forceful enough to inflate the lungs for the first time, because remember what's in there right now, fluid. All that's got to come out, and they have to inflate. So one thing that we need and the baby needs too is surfactants. So if the baby is full term, the surfactant reduces the surface tension in the lungs and allows those alveoli to inflate and stay open, right? And um, if you don't have surfactant, they can inflate and then collapse back. And then the baby's really going to have a hard time breathing. So this is a risk for, pre for premature babies. Um, but thankfully, we have uh, figured out how to manufacture surfactant, and it can be given to the baby. You just have to do it, like, pretty quickly to allow those lungs to properly inflate and stuff and have to keep giving it to them until they can produce enough on their own. Um, after birth... The newborn has to live off of its fat stores for two to three days until the mother's milk fully comes in. And um, during that time, the newborn, or during the first four weeks as a newborn, it is susceptible to dehydration because all of its little mechanisms, homeostatic mechanisms, aren't fully functioning yet, uh, especially the ones involving water conservation. So it still takes them a little bit for everything to get going. Um, the fetal hemoglobin production will decrease because he's no longer a fetus, baby's no longer a fetus, and by four months, the circulating hemoglobin is adult hemoglobin. Uh, a number of changes occur in the newborn circulation, so all of these adaptations are going to go away. So we've cut the umbilical cord, right? So the umbilical vessels will constrict. That ductus venosus constricts and goes away. We don't need that connection between the liver and the uh, vena cava. The foramen ovale, the hole between the two atria should close, and the ductus arteriosus constricts and closes. So all of these things go away. So these can happen as quickly as within the first 15 minutes after birth, but it could take a full year for that foramen ovale to fully close. And if it doesn't fully close, then you would have an atrial septal defect. And so here again, uh, the same graph kind of, but so we've, we've clipped that umbilical cord. So this adaptation here, the ductus venosus is going to go away. The ductus arteriosus is going to go away. The foramen ovale is going to close. All right, so what would happen if that foramen ovale didn't, does not close? I've mentioned that. Just a little critical thinking. You should be able to. Uh, answer that. So here's where I was gonna I was talking about the different phases of development. So we have the neonatal period, which is birth to the fourth week, end of the fourth week, so the first month basically. Um, and then we have infancy. 
So uh, that's from the end of the fourth week all the way to the end of the, you know, the when they turn one to the one year. And then uh, childhood is one year to puberty, although we do break childhood down sometimes into toddlerhood and preschool and all of that. But, you know, that's basically childhood. And uh, puberty, of course, is when the hormones start kicking in. And then uh, that would be adolescence from puberty to adulthood. Uh, but then even in adulthood, we have young adulthood, middle, middle age adult, etc. But uh, adulthood is basically from adolescence to old age. What's old age kind of depends on who you ask. But senescence is old age to death. So this is when you, you do see this gradual decline in function um, as the, the person ages. And you have, you know, all the systems don't, don't work as well. So let's talk a little bit about aging. Passive aging and active aging. So passive aging is the breakdown of structures and the slowing of functions. What we think of when we think of aging, really. At the molecular level, elastin and collagen degenerate. You'll see, you'll see more wrinkles appear. Um, faulty genetic instructions due to biochemical abnormalities during cell division will cause cells to die. So you have kind of some loss of function here. Um, loss of functions in the kidneys slowly, you know, not gradually, no, gradual, not 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 drastically. Um, breakdown of lipids occur. Uh, the mitochondria and the cells don't work as well, so not as much energy around and stuff. And then you have more free radicals, and those can uh, kill cells and destabilize adjacent structures and stuff like that. So. Um, so that's passive aging, so I really think of, of aging. But there's also active aging. So this is the, the idea that you have a time clock on your cells. And it begins prior to birth, and um, it's programmed in certain cells as part of development. And it's a process of programmed cell death, and pro cell death is apoptosis. And uh, for example, red cells live 120 days. That would be an example, so that at 120 days, they die and they pull from circulation and they're replaced with fresh ones. Another example is the lining of your GI tract, where uh, the lining cells are replaced about every three days, and so they're constantly being replaced. You're constantly shedding skin cells and replacing skin cells, etc. So those, you know, they have a program, kind of program death there. Um, if you have a lot of active agents, you can see autoimmune attacks on the cells can occur more often because as they rupture and the components are, are let loose, uh, they should be scavenged and taken up. But if they're not, or if that process is slow, you can potentially make antibodies to things like your own DNA, basically. Um, the cells will continue to die throughout our lives so that new healthy cells can replace them. So that's the process of active agent. It's that cell turnover to maintain adequate function of different organs and stuff. Okay, so pulling damaged red cells from circulation would be active aging or passive aging, select one. <clears throat> and let's talk a little bit about genetics. Actually, I'm going to move for just a split second, grab a drink, because it's a lot of talking, but I want to get this done for you guys. Okay, so um, inherited tra traits are determined by DNA sequences that make up genes. Right, the field of genetics will investigate how genes give certain characteristics that affect your health or give you certain characteristics. So, you know, some of them are pretty obvious, like your hair color, eye color, skin color, all that kind of stuff. But other things, not so much, you know. And so uh, some of the stuff they may look at uh, would be, you know, what all the genes involved in the risk of diabetes, risk of cardiovascular disease, risk of dementia, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then how are these genes passed from generation to generation? So that's the whole field of genetics. And there are a lot of off, um, off shoots, if you will, of genetics. Yeah, so genetics and, and genomics, you have, uh, from there you have epigenetics, um, which looks at how um, the expression of those genes are turned on and off by env on environmental cues. And then you have metabolomics, which look at the whole total of the, all the stuff that's produced because of the genetic code. And anyway, there is a whole bunch of ways to study this. Anyway, um, mutations will occur when a gene's DNA sequence changes. So that would be a mutation. A mutation is an actual change in the DNA sequence. And environmental factors will influence how most genes are expressed. So um, 
environmental factors are yes like toxins and maybe you know cigarette smoke is an environmental factor but um you know living in a polluted area living in a city but also for example if you live in the country what they're spraying on the fields and what you're breathing all of that also what you put on your body so if you look at all the lotions and shampoos and soaps and stuff like that what's in those you know so those are um environmental factors another environmental factors are uh, your diet what you eat what's that composed of do you have a bunch of chemicals in what you eat you have just you know good healthy food what's 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 coming in because all of those are signals so okay let's talk about chromosomes and genes so chromosomes and genes come in pairs okay you get one from each one from mom and one from dad and uh, charts called karyotypes will display the 23 chromosome pairs or your 46 chromosomes in total of a normal human somatic cell which is a human body cell your autosomes are pairs 1 through 22 and they do not carry the genes that determine sex and those are on the 23rd pair and they're the X and the Y and they determine sex and they're called the sex chromosomes. So female, your XX, male, your XY. And um, the alleles are variants of a gene trait. Um, if they're identical, they're called homozygous. If they're different, they're called heterozygous. So let's think about this. So um, in terms of eye color, so if you look in your family, you might be able to determine this. But for example, in my family, my dad has blue eyes and my mom has hazel eyes and I have hazel eyes. So, um, but um, I know, well, I know I'm heterozygous and I have hazel and blue because my dad had blue eyes and blue is a homozygous trait. You have to have both to express blue eyes because it's a recessive. But, um, Hazel, my mom could have carried some blue or something like that. Okay, and so um, I know I have a blue eye trait because one of my kids has blue eyes, and uh, his dad obviously was also carrying the blue eye gene, even though he does not have blue eyes. His dad had hazel eyes, so I'm heterozygous for uh, in my eye color. I have hazel and blue. My husband has hetero heterozygous. He has hazel and blue. Those hazel and blue are the two alleles for. Um, eye color the ones that won out on both of us were the hazel right but our son ended up with blue eyes because he got a blue eye gene from both of us so he is homozygous for blue eyes and he ha actually has blue eyes so your combination of your alleles that you got from your mom and your dad is your genotype and the characteristics that are associated with your genotype and they're actually expressed and what you see is your phenotype so for example my genotype for eye color is hazel and blue but my phenotype what I have is hazel so there you go so this is a karyotype so again so in this example uh, this is chromosome 1, this is chromosome 2, this is chromosome 3. So this individual, and I'm just going to randomly say, you could say, oh, this one came from mom, that one came from dad. It's kind of hard to tell unless you do more deeper genetic analysis. But you get one from mom, one from dad, one from mom, one from dad. And, and the order that the display is kind of random. But So these are the first 22 are your autosomal pairs, and the 23rd one is your sex chromosome here. All right, so um, what are the eye color alleles in your immediate family? Can you do the same kind of reasoning as I just did? And um, so modes of inheritance are patterns of inheritance through families. So uh, you can have dominant or recessive inheritance. So a dominant allele will mask the expression of a recessive allele. So a dominant allele pretty, pretty much always expresses itself. It will dominate over the recessive. Um, an allele that causes a trait of disease can be recessive or dominant, and it can be either autosomal or sex-linked. And we're going to kind of dive a little deeper into that. So that's how you would inherit it. You can inherit it recessive, dominant, or autosomal, or um, sex-linked. And if it's, autos it's a uh, disease that's carried on autosomal chromosomes, then it will affect both sexes, so both boys and girls can get it. If it's X-linked, it will mainly affect males, and Y-linked are only passed from father to son. So that's in different ways it can be inherited. 
So let's talk about, again, dominant and recessive inheritance. So a person can receive an autosomal recessive gene from two healthy parents that are heterozygous for that trait, and they're called carriers. It's like, what the heck does that mean? So let's use, for example, sickle cell as an example. So um, to get, to, to have the sickle cell disease, which is inherited genetically, two people that are carriers for sickle cell that are healthy, they don't know their carriers unless they've been screened genetically. And so they're healthy, mom's healthy, dad's healthy, they get together to have a baby. They don't know that they're both carriers and baby gets a sickle cell gene from, from mom and a sickle cell gene from dad and lo and behold, baby has sickle cell. So you have to have, this is a autosomal recessive so that you ha the baby has to get a defective gene from mom and a defective gene from dad to have the disease. If the, the baby had gotten a defective from mom and a good one from dad, then just the baby is a carrier. And then, you know, and just, you know, so it's kind of just depends who they get with, whether then that baby later on would have a child with sickle cell or not. So a person can inherit a condition from a heterozygous parent and a homozygous recessive pa uh, parent also. So um, let's say in our um, sickle cell um, scenario, because it is, it kind of fits that, the heterozygous parent would be the carrier. It would have a normal gene and a sickle cell gene. And then the homozygous recessive would be a, 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 a the other parent has sickle cell. Now, if you have sickle cell, why would you want to make kids and pass that on? Because that you, someone's guaranteed that they will at least be carriers. I don't know, but I'm sure it happens. Um, anyway, and, and by the way, pregnancy for a female that has sickle cell is actually quite dangerous. But that, if, if so basically if a sickle cell person has a baby with a sickle cell carrier, it's just about guaranteed, just almost guaranteed, but it's one way that is, a, no, let's not say guaranteed, is there's a very high probability that this child is going to have sickle cell, okay? Another way that you can inherit, so a person who inherits a dominant condition will have at least one affected parent. So for example, Huntington's disease is a dominant condition, meaning that if you just have one one of the genes, so let's say you got the gene from, from mom, and it's the Huntington disease gene, all you have to have is one of those, it's dominant, and you will have Huntington's, okay? And so that means that then the parent has Huntington. So, uh, you know, that can be passed, and the parent could be a mom or a dad, but because it just when the dominant condition it just takes one copy of the gene and it will override the normal. Um, the three major modes of inheritance then are autosomal recessive, so that was our sickle cell example, autosomal dominant, that's our Huntington's disease um, example, and then X-linked recessive. So um, the, um, oh, the hemophilia, sorry. It escaped me for a second. Hemophilia is X-linked recessive, and it tends to affect boys more because it's carried on the sex chromosome. And uh, with a female, uh, it's recessive, and so um, it's for the female because it's uh, the equip where it's carried. The equivalent on the X chromosome would have the, likely have the normal gene. Uh, it would the normal would overwrite the that recessive uh, hemophilia gene, whereas with the boy. Um, it only it only gets uh, the one recessive g defective gene with no counter part, and so boys will tend to have uh, you know the the effect of a hemophilia more because it's X-linked recessive inheritance. A pennant square will symbolize the logic used to determine the probabilities of genotypes in an offspring. I'm going to show you that. And a pedigree shows the family members, how they're related, and maybe who has what, like um, maybe genetically, if you're just following a certain trait through the family. So let's use, like, this is cystic fibrosis. Uh, so it's follows the same kind of pattern as sickle cell. So you could have two carrier parents. They don't have any signs or symptoms of cystic fibrosis. They're healthy. They uh, carry um, the, in their chromosomes a healthy gene and a uh, cystic fibrosis gene, each do. And so uh, they form a family and start having kids. 
And so the probabilities uh, are such uh, as either the baby will get healthy from dad and healthy from mom and the baby will be healthy. Okay, so the the healthy is uh, the positive there, and then CF is cystic fibrosis. So that would be uh, the the possibilities of uh, the alleles from mom are healthy and cystic fibrosis. The alleles from dad are healthy and cystic fibrosis. So if they get healthy from mom and healthy from dad, it's going to be a healthy baby, not even a carrier of cystic fibrosis. Or it could get a healthy gene from dad and a disease gene from mom, okay, a cystic fibrosis gene from mom, so that would be this one, and so we would get the, um, this is dad, so the healthy from dad and the cystic fibrosis from mom, and so we would have a baby that's a cystic fibrosis carrier, or they could get the cystic fibrosis from dad and the healthy from mom, right here, so CF from dad, healthy from mom, maybe that baby right here, that baby would be a carrier for cystic fibrosis, or they could be get cystic fibrosis from mom, cystic fibrosis gene from dad, and be a cystic fibrosis baby, and that would be this one. And so if you look at this logically, and even like drawn out like this, you can see that um, the, the parents' chances of, you know, they have basically a 25% chances of having a healthy baby, a 25% chance of having a cystic fibrosis baby, and a 50% chance of having a carrier, a baby that's a carrier for cystic fibrosis. And then this is the, the tree that shows, you know, how, you know, different genes and, uh, you know, how that could be how things people are related and stuff. And then this is a, a pen square with blue eyes and brown eyes, so brown eyes being recessive and, um, uh, blue eyes being recessive, brown eyes is dominant, and so like for example here you have a dad with brown eyes, but he has both genes uh, for brown eyes dominant right there, and then mom has got brown eyes, but also has a gene for blue eyes that's masked, but mom's got brown eyes, and so you have basically 50% of the babies are going to be, I'll have nothing but brown eye genes, and they'll pass, that's all they'll pass down. So all of their kids will likely have brown eyes. Okay. And then you have half of the kids here have the possibility they'll have brown eyes, but they'll carry the allele for blue eyes. So if one of these gets together with somebody that has blue eyes, they could have blue eyed babies. Um, so anyway, that just kind of shows you the possibilities of the pennant squares of, you know, when you mix the genetic material, what will happen and stuff. And so um, if both mom and dad have brown eyes, that's the dominant trait, and one of the kids has blue eyes, how can this be? So just think about it here and answer it. And then a little bit on multifactorial traits. So um, most traits are influenced to some extent by your environmental um, factors such as your nutrition, physical activity, exposure to toxins, etc. Uh, like I've already mentioned earlier. And also genes can influence each other. So polygenic traits are those that are determined by one or more gene and are affected, they are more affected by environmental factors. And they are continuously varying in the population. And so um, these polygenic traits, uh, so traits that are molded by one or more genes plus the environment are called multifactorial traits. So they're polygenic plus affected by the environment. And things like height, skin color, heart disease, diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, and cancers are all examples of these multifactorial traits. So let's take height, for example. So um, you have, you know, the genetic, your genetic height that you're going to potentially be, but let's say um, you're not physically active, or, or as a, a child is not physically active, they, or maybe they were injured or something like that, and they're not outside running around and growing and climbing and doing stuff, and also maybe they're undernourished, they don't have, or they don't have ideal nutrition, they're only getting junk food, they're only getting, you know, tater tots and pizza rolls or something like that. And so uh, what could happen is over time simply they just don't reach their pre-programmed height, the, they, they don't reach their full potential because of all of these factors put together. Um, skin color is another one. So um, we all have kind of a different range of colors our skin can be, uh, and so and they, it could depend on if you living up north and you're inside all the time, you're probably going to be a way lighter shade than if you were living in a tropical island and were out in the sun all the time, okay? So skin color can vary there too. 
anyway, so those, those are just examples. Uh, but even like some of the disease ones, um, diabetes. So you could have the genetic, some of the genetics and diabetes runs in your family, but really to, to, to fully express this, you have to, um, you know, you basically, if you eat the standard American diet, you eat a lot of junk, you eat a lot of bread, you eat a lot of pasta, a lot of sodas and stuff like that, then chances are you're going to, you're going to develop diabetes, but you could say, oh, diabetes runs in my family, maybe I'm going to lead a really healthy lifestyle, and, and you stay away from junk food and stuff like that, you don't drink sodas and all that, well, it's very possible that even though you have the genetics for it, you could never, you, it's possible to never develop diabetes because of your lifestyle, because of the other inputs in there. And so, same thing for hypertension and cancer and all of that. Okay, so if you have any questions, put them up there. And I appreciate your attention and uh, your kind viewing of the lessons over the semester. And uh, thank you very much.